Welcome to the Head and Neck Cancer 2020 video series presented by St. Vincent's Hospital Sydney, the Kinghorn Cancer Centre and St. Vincent's Private Hospital Sydney. Innovations in Radiation Therapy with Meryn Findlay. Well, welcome back to this video on innovations in care and treatment in radiation therapy for the head and neck cancer patient. So far, we've been talking to a radiation oncologist and a speech pathologist, and now another utterly critical member of the team, a life-saving member of the team, the dietitian. Meryn, can you introduce yourself and explain your role with head and neck cancer? Sure, my name's Meryn Findlay. I'm an advanced accredited practicing dietitian. Um, I have specialised in the field of head and neck cancer for close to 20 years. I'm currently employed as the Executive Research Lead for Cancer Nutrition at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital in Sydney Local Health District. Um, and in that role, we uh, partner with Chris O'Brien Lifehouse Cancer Centre um, to provide the best possible cancer care to our patients with head and neck cancer. Look, we're here to talk about innovation, but I'm always mindful there could be a person watching this who's just been diagnosed with head and neck cancer and they haven't met their dietitian yet. Uh, I referred to you as life-saving. That's not an, an overstatement, is it? Why are you a life-saving profession for the head and neck cancer patient? Absolutely, and I'm glad to hear you say that, Julie. I mean, basically the fundamentals of, of human physiology dictate that we, we require nutrition in order to optimally function, in order to go about our lives and do the things that we want to do. So, you know, when nutrition is, is something so fundamental to maintaining good health, um, it makes so much sense that it's actually even more vital in times of when we are, in periods when we're unwell um, and that we need to be in the best shape possible to get through cancer treatment. And we've heard from uh, Dion Forstner and also from Therese Dodds that the radiation can impact quite significantly on the capacity to swallow. So can you give us uh, an understanding of how you assist the head and neck cancer patient who's affected by their radiation therapy to basically keep taking in nutrition? Absolutely. So the dietitian's role in amongst the multidisciplinary team is to provide support to patients and their caregivers with family members um, in order to optimise a person's nutrition. Um, what does that mean, optimise a person's nutrition? So our, our goals usually are to um, encourage as much nutrition as possible in order to meet that person's requirements. Um, to prevent any unintentional weight loss and um, because unplanned weight loss is actually um, quite a concern in this particular setting. Um, losing weight dramatically through side effects of cancer care is not um, what we're aiming for. Um, there's a practical reason for that in the sense that the mask that Dion showed us earlier is performing an important function of, of fitting a person and that that is actually targeting the appropriate treatment area. Um, but also, you know, adequate nutrition means that you preserve your lean muscle stores. That's where your strength and function is. Um, and there's a number of different strategies that we use um, in order to help people meet their nutritional requirements. I managed to keep swallowing, but I lost a lot of weight. Can you explain why is it important that we don't lose too much weight and the different ways you try to get food into us even as our swallowing gets harder and harder to manage. The thing that a lot of people find it hard to understand is that malnutrition is actually very prevalent in patients with head and neck cancer, and that is regardless of their body weight. You don't have to be underweight to be malnourished. And what we do know is that people who are malnourished are less likely to get through treatment, they're less likely to recover well, they're more likely to need hospital admission, um, and there's a lot of um, roll-on effects of, of loss of function and um, ability to do the day-to-day -day tasks when someone becomes malnourished. So the ways that we manage that um, in order to really give people the best chance of getting through treatment and recovering, um, first line is to look at what we can do with dietary strategies for people eating by mouth. Uh, and that will be things like maybe modifying the texture of the foods, making them softer, more moist. They might need to be on a texture modified diet that we usually work with in consultation with our speech pathology colleagues in order to know what the recommendation should be for that person so that when they're swallowing, the food's going down the right way, going down the food pipe, not the wind pipe. Um, 
And so things like um, maybe minced, mashed or pureed foods for those people. The second line is really fortifying food so that we're adding additional energy or additional protein. So that's a way that we can make really every mouthful count so that um, everything someone is swallowing is having the, the most effect in terms of nutritional benefit. Um, and then for people that are really struggling with their intake orally and they're becoming malnourished, they're losing weight, and we know that about 5% body weight is actually what we call critical weight loss, where it does potentially impact on a person's outcomes. So nutrition support can take the form of tube feeding where a nasogastric tube is put through the nose, down through into the stomach, and that people are able to administer a medical nutrition formula that goes through that and also um, hydration and also medications. They're the three things that we um, would put down a tube if someone is unable to swallow. And the other type of tube is a gastrostomy tube, which is, tends to be used in a sort of more medium, longer term type arrangement. And that really depends on the person's circumstances as to what their care team might recommend. And what is the gastrostomy tube? So a gastrostomy tube is used for um, medium to longer term use. Um, and it's placed, it can be placed either endoscopically, radiologically or surgically. So there's different medical procedures involved with your insertion. Um, but essentially it's something that sits underneath your clothing. It's not visible um, while you're going about your day-to-day -day, um, life, uh, but you can actually use it to administer nutritional formula, um, especially for those people who are unable to eat enough to maintain their nutrition. And is it always a tube through your tummy? In most, if a gastrostomy it is, is into the stomach, yes. In my case, I was able to keep swallowing throughout my treatment, uh, but I have uh, uh, friends in different parts of Australia and different parts of the world where the, the, the practice within their cancer team was to insert a tube in the tummy or a peg tube right from the word go. Uh, in my observation, there's varied practices in varied locations. Is, is, that, is it basically something that you, you talk to your team about and, and see what they think? We do look at the evidence around this and we do know that, that preventing people from deteriorating in terms of their nutrition will help them in the long run. But ultimately, what type of nutrition support is in your best interest, is, that's a decision that's best made discussing with your care team, your dietitian, your speech pathologist, your treating oncologists and surgeons, and collectively help you arrive at a decision that's right for you. I want to ask you about any current or uh, recent research that gives us insight into uh, the um, nutritional needs of the head and neck cancer patient in relation to radiation therapy or, or more broadly. Before I do that, is there any other aspect of care from a dietitian's point of view that you'd like to mention? One of the things that we have worked very hard on here in Australia is to look at um, the best available evidence. In fact, we've led the development and dissemination of internationally endorsed um, guidelines for the nutritional management of adult patients with head and neck cancer. And we were lucky enough to do that in partnership with the Clinical Oncology Society of Australia and Cancer Council Australia. So those guidelines are available on a wiki platform. Um, and essentially what it, they really highlight that access, early access to a specialist dietitian who is a core member of the MDT and that frequent um, dietetic intervention, counselling, before, during and after treatment is actually um, essential to optimising outcomes for patients. Okay, so if people take nothing else from this video, if they're a patient, make sure you see a dietitian before, during and after treatment. Absolutely, and, and that's particularly often people who um, are newly coming to our centre with a new diagnosis um, they are often feeling well, eating and drinking well without any problems and may wonder why on earth do I need to see a dietitian? Why do I need to see a speech pathologist? And, um, you know, those are the people that we really want to make sure that we see early, um, advise them on what the possibilities are in terms of the toxicities or side effects of treatment um, and really have that early chance to optimise nutrition um, because with nutrition, prevention is better than cure. And some people struggle to regain uh, uh, anything near their pre-treatment weight. Why is that? Probably some of the factors are around their ability to eat as well as they had previously. Um, and I think 
following the speech pathologist and dietitian's advice during treatment, treatment sets you up into the best possible scenario um, for maximising your recovery. And, and what we call swallowing and nutrition rehabilitation is that post-treatment period where we're really trying to optimise people's intake, um, swallowing function, and um, you know, getting people off feeding tubes who happen to require one and returning them to as normal a diet as possible. And is that process of coming off a tube something that you really do need supervision and management to help you do it? Absolutely. And in fact, we have a duty of care as long as someone has a feeding tube, we really need to make sure that they are being looked after appropriately, uh, receiving the appropriate guidance and advice on how to wean their fe feeds without opt um, compromising their nutrition um, and maximising the variety in their diet. Of course, nutritional adequacy um, and weight maintenance are all important parts about um, removing a feeding tube. And do you go through a period where you're taking food in orally and you're having Absolutely. the feeding tube? The two are not mutually exclusive. We always encourage um, where possible for people to keep swallowing um, and as our speech pathologist colleagues um, have said today that it's really important to keep those swallowing muscles working in order to maximise function. If you had to sum up two or three key messages for patients watching this today, what are they? What do you want them to remember from a, from a dietitian's point of view? I would say that nutrition is a vital part of your overall care. Think of it as a form of treatment. Um, take your advice from your care team and look for information from reliable evidence-based sources, places like Beyond Five, from Cancer Council, um, because there's a lot of information on the internet, there's equally a lot of misinformation. And certainly when it comes to nutrition, there's a lot of misleading um, things that, that aren't necessarily appropriate or suitable for someone with a head and neck cancer diagnosis. And one of the things that can be very hard for people is they lose taste. I certainly lost the capacity to taste food for quite some time. For most people, will the capacity to taste food come back? For a lot of people, it does improve. Um, it is in relation to things like chemotherapy that can cause a, a taste changes in a short-term period. Uh, and it's often, as Dion would have mentioned, the radiation therapy causing a longer-term dry mouth. Uh, the newer radiation techniques are designed to minimise the impact of that. Um, but if you do have a dry mouth, it will impact taste because saliva is partly what helps us register flavour. So staying well hydrated um, is, is also important. Maintaining uh, moist food. If your mouth is dry, it's far more comfortable to uh, manoeuvre that around the mouth and swallow. And those sorts of things can actually be useful tips, carrying your water bottle those sorts of things. Just finally, from my point of view, um, we've briefly mentioned the impact on your teeth uh, uh, in our conversation with the radiation oncologist, that the, the impact on saliva is bad for your teeth. And we do have a video in this series where we look in depth at the oral needs and the dental needs of head and neck cancer patients. But is that something you as a dietitian supervising someone after treatment might say, look, make sure you get yourself to the dentist. Is that, does that come within your frame? Absolutely. I mean, dietitians take a very whole person view to nutrition assessment and intervention. It's, you know, physical aspects, including dentition. So make, if, if someone has um, problems with their teeth, it is a very um, immediate barrier to them being able to bite, chew, swallow well. Um, and it can have a big impact on the variety of foods that they're able to actually consume and therefore nutritional adequacy can become an issue for those people. And that's so important, isn't it? Because some uh, patients need to have quite a few teeth extracted prior to radiation treatment because it can be a challenge to have extractions after radiation treatment. So you would be dealing quite often with patients who've lost quite a few teeth. Yes, absolutely. And, and they will often still have sore um, gums while their mouth is healing and they're limited in what they can manage. And that's really a time that we need to ramp up modifying the texture of the foods, adding extra sauces and gravies to make the food more moist, um, fortifying with higher energy or calories um, and additional protein. Just before I let you go, is there any current or recent research that you think it's important to alert both patients and members of the multidisciplinary team who are watching this too, you know, what's happening that's important? 
Some of the work we've done in our centre has been around implementation of nutrition care evidence into practice. Through that, we, we developed a supportive care-led pre-treatment clinic. So that was um, run by a specialist dietitian and specialist nurse. Um, and through that innovation, we've been able to demonstrate that those patients had greater access to specialist care early, in line with best available evidence. It also meant that those patients had um, less treatment breaks, both radiation and chemotherapy, and were less likely to be admitted to hospital. So there were benefits to patients, as also the healthcare system in terms of a, a cost reduction with those avoided unplanned admissions. And have you been able to continue that pre-treatment clinic or was it only for a research purpose? It was initiated as a pilot in response to us interviewing our patients and caregivers to find out what they needed from their nutrition care. But it was such a successful um, pilot that that now has been incorporated into standard care in our centre. One issue that's been raised in these videos is that sometimes really good work is done as part of research, but it doesn't necessarily get funded or integrated into the system. So that's a wonderful success, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so it was said to me, can we afford to continue this? And my pushback was then, can we afford not to? Malnutrition is insidious. It costs the patient greatly in terms of function and getting through treatment, and it costs the healthcare system enormously. Look, Maren, can I just say, as a head and neck cancer patient, aware of your work, thank you so much for your dedication, your professionalism, your focus on evidence gathering and disseminating, because this is an area that needs it so much, and uh, we are truly grateful. Thank you for having me, Julie. <laughs> and so, ladies and gentlemen, that is the final of our three interviews, looking at innovations in treatment and care in relation to radiation therapy. And remember that 13 11 20 is the Cancer Council number, information and support line, 13 11 20. And as we've mentioned, beyond5.org.au is a fantastic website. And thank you so much for taking an interest in head and neck cancer. Head and Neck Cancer, Treatment Innovations, Improving Survival and Quality of Life. Providing up-to-date, evidence-based information for everyone in the Head and Neck Cancer community. Presented by Julie McCrossan, a Head and Neck Cancer survivor. Media production by Daniel Taylor at Insight IT. Celebrating World Head and Neck Cancer Day, 27th of July, 2020. Innovations in surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, dental care, managing distress and recovery, managing mask anxiety, remove the mask research, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander patients, family and community. Discussions of innovations that are improving survival and quality of life for patients with head and neck cancers. The 2020 Head and Neck Cancer Video Series. Presented by St Vincent's Hospital Sydney, the Kinghorn Cancer Centre and St Vincent's Private Hospital Sydney.